I don't know. It. Like I come from, like I grew up as for a hockey town in a very like not like sophisticated hockey. I grew up in Philadelphia, so like the team I grew up with was just people that fought. And like my dad first started taking me to hockey games. You know, he always talk about the Broad Street Brawlers, like like Bobby Clark and or Bobby Clark and Bernie Perron, like all those guys that basically like if you got the puck away from them, they would just fight you, <laughs> take the puck back, and they would score. Bernie Perron, half blind goalie too. That's kind of weird. I grew up, I grew up there, and I moved to Florida. Why the move? Economics. You know, just my dad lost his job in that area, and. Uh, he had a better opportunity in Florida, and I really, you know, I was here and over there about living in Philly, so I'm just like, yeah, cool, let's see what happens. I mean, even at the time, though, I wasn't angry, so I'm like, cool, I don't like anybody here anyway. Then I got to Florida, and I realized you can move anywhere you like, but people are all the same. It's all the same ratio of, of kinds of people, you know, the same crappy person for capital, no matter what town you're in. What kind of circumstances went into the making of this record? My dad died. Uh, you know, one of our best friends decided he didn't want to play with us anymore. You know, and it wasn't under, you know, dramatic pretenses. You know, like we're all adults, and he said that, you know, thought his time was finished and we all said okay man well we'd rather have you as a friend than keep you stay around and then eventually we're like screw you no screw you man I hate you and then we got a blog about it so uh, the thing about it is that I think that really affected it was you know for me it was the loss of a family member that was like probably my closest and almost only family that I had left and then the split with Atlantic had a lot to do with it too, in a way, because as we were recording demos for the record and writing songs, like, before when we released You Come Before You, they stayed out of our way. And then all of a sudden, everybody got fired. Because that's what made the label. They, they, like, every two years, they fire everybody, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. They got days on the calendar. Yeah. And all the new people that were coming into the situation had all these things to say about what we should do. And it really made all of us angry. So then we started writing these demos that were like intentionally exactly against what they asked for. You know, like up to song structures, chord like chord arrangements between both guitars that basically just made noise. Uh, like I recorded a demo that as soon as the whole song was done, I made a, a, like a, a track of what I was recording on an overhead mic that we used for a cymbal, like turned all the way up so it instantly fed back. And then I played the song through headphones and I stuffed the mic in the headphones and it just created ear piercing feedback. And then I mixed that as loud as it would go for the entire course of the song. So it was just basically unlistenable and painful. And you know, it, it got to the point where we'd hand them stuff and I would just start chuckling and just being like, you're gonna love that one. And it got to the point where it was just like, they kept saying these things and we just eventually sat down one day and we're like, look, you know what you guys really need to like, factor into like your opinion of what we should do? is the fact that I'm sticking my middle finger up at you. I'm just not doing it physically. So eventually we all found a way to like say, okay, this is not going to work anymore. So they and we had to come to an agreement of how to split up, which was really frustrating. It took a long time and was very annoying to all of us. Because it, you know, their way of doing things makes no sense to anyone else. Mm -hmm. So that I think had an effect on it. Like it just pushed us to want to like write as, whether in detrimental or not, honest and I guess like antagonistic of a record as possible. I think that when things when it was finished and I listened to it, I was like, wow, this is like really going to antagonize anybody that likes us. And, and almost antagonize anybody new that had never heard us that is now hearing us for the first time. Because it's just, it's a frustrating sounding record to me. Like it's all very dense and it never really kind of comes to like a release or anything like that. It always just stays very like So I think that was a really 
important point for us to make on the record too is that it should sound frustrating from start to finish. What do you say to fans who who missed the style of your first couple of releases? Sorry. I mean, I don't know like how apologetic I can be. Like, I've always had the idea that you should always be really 100% honest with the things that you put out there. And I think that as I've grown as a person and, and as I've grown as a person that writes music, like, I've wanted to always push myself to reapproach and change the way that I express myself each time that I try to put something out there. So I would say I'm sorry that, you know, you aren't really into what's happening now. And I don't expect you to continue to listen to our band if it's not something that you like, but I really feel proud and grateful that I made something that you liked at least once, you know. Most people that make music don't even get that chance. So I'm grateful no matter what, either way, either way a person feels, I still feel grateful that, you know, for one minute I had a song that meant something. I don't know, I'm like a very stubborn person where I'm actually 100% grateful for everything, but when it comes to things like people's opinions on what I should or shouldn't have done, I become extremely like, I'm, you know, you think that and that's cool, but like, I can only do what I want to do because otherwise I'd be being dishonest with somebody and dishonest with myself. Yeah. And I think a lot of people tend to get angry and when bands like change their sound, especially if it's in a more commercial, seemingly commercial direction, people are like, you sell out, you sell out, you sell out. But I think that selling out can, ha can happen on such a smaller scale. Even if you're taking the people that like the band from the first record that you put out, if you take their opinion as what you should do next, you're selling yourself out. In which case, you're selling them out anyway, because now you're not delivering honesty. You're delivering something that's calculated and premeditated. I think that that's one of the other big problems with music, is people sitting around in bands talking with each other about what they think they should do to improve their audience and things like that. And instead of sitting down and talking about what they think they should do to improve their music, instead of keeping it tight between themselves, so that Every time you put something out, you're proud, and you also have the level of dignity that you have because of how honest everything needs to be maintained to keep everything happy. You know, and I think that that was one thing that we always thought about early on when we started to really push ourselves to change. It was just like, well, we don't want to end up like that. I don't want to be a band that sort of just stays with the status quo of what people think we should do, mm -hmm. and then six years from now, I'll be like, I hate everything we did. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want to be able to come away with it. Like, no matter what mistakes we made as a band, like socially or, you know, musically, I at least want to come away from it with the innocence that I did it the way I wanted it to. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, labels and, and bands that are huge, you know, they want to complain about downloading and things like that. And I, I can't bring myself to complain about that. Because without downloading, like, I would have never been able to go on tour. And, and in the first place, I kind of think, like, art should be free. You know, like, the only reason to have a label is to pay for a recording. But after that, you know, it's just, like, all advertising money. And it seems to me that, like, labels, like, especially major labels, indie labels kind of have it more figured out quicker with the way things develop with technology. Major labels now are, are when they sign bands, are saying that they get a percentage of their touring like money. It's just like, that's like the new model, and it's just like, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You know, you don't have to put $2 million into a band. If they're good, they're good, and people are gonna dig it. And if they are crap, then yeah, you gotta put $2 million in and make people think that they should do it. just showed up bags in hand bags in hand it gives me chills how easy I thought it would be so I let it Bags in hand, bags in hand.